like I said, you can open up no week number nine under Elios under the lessons tab, and you can find all of these PowerPoints in there too. All right. So urine, it's tinkle time. We talked about one of the dirty little things the body does, the defecation. Now we get to talk about urine. Lots of fun. So what, of course, are the primary organs for the renal system? The kidneys, yep. And what's the other major one? The bladder, yep. So the kidney and the bladder and then the connections in between and the pathway to get out. But when you look at the kidneys, their main functions, every one of their functions are maintain homeostasis, which is maintenance of the what environment? Internal. What are they trying to maintain? The interstitial fluid primarily? What environment is going through the kidneys for you to regulate? The blood. Yep. So they're trying to regulate everything through the plasma. And when you look at it, it's going to regulate water balance. So if you have too little water, what are the kidneys going to do? Make you filter more or reabsorb more? Reabsorb more. You filter less, you reabsorb more. It's going to regulate the quantity and concentration of the extracellular fluid ions. So the ions in the plasma, things like potassium, sodium, calcium, chloride, those are all ions. Remember, they have a little plus charge over it. What's another mean little plus charge out there that's really damaging or destructive? One letter with a plus over it. H plus, which is hydrogen ion, which we know more affectionately as an acid, right? So it's going to help relate, regulate things like acids and bases. Uh, which I think is one of these other ones down here. But number three, maintain proper plasma volume, of course, the blood. And then number four, assistance in main, maintaining the proper acid base balance, which I just mentioned. It can kick out phosphates, <coughs> excuse me. It can kick out hydrogen, it can kick out um, bicarbonate, all of these things to help you regulate your pH. And we'll talk about how that works. Uh, number five, maintain proper osmolarity. What's that talking about? Osmolarity. Water to solute concentrations. So you may have way too much water in your body, and even though you're kind of slightly dehydrated, which doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense, but when you look at the water concentration, if you're dehydrated but you have a high water concentration compared to your solutes, your body's actually going to start kicking more water out. Is that going to be helpful? No, it's going to be dangerous. So number five, maintaining osmolarity, which is different than volume. This is the water to solute concentration. Right, number six, eliminate waste products of bodily metabolism, things like urea ammonia, acetone, that if you've had lab already, we've talked a little bit about it. When you break down things like proteins and lipids and carbs, you get these metabolites. Number seven, excrete lots of foreign compounds like penicillin. Anything your body doesn't like, even if it's not harmful to it, your body is going to push it to the kidney and say, get rid of this for me. Your body absolutely hates penicillin old school penicillin. Now we've modified it so much that it stays in your body longer, but back in the day when they first came out with penicillin, penicillin goes through your system, stays in there for about a half hour to an hour, and then you urinate it out. That's bad because what do you have to keep doing then if you're fighting a bacterial infection? Yeah, every hour you're going to have to pop penicillin. Well, back when they first discovered penicillin, they didn't have that much. So people would eat penicillin and they would make them do what because they'd run out of supplies? Drink their own urine to get that penicillin back into them. Nasty. What? Bear Grist does it. Anybody could do it. Man, that guy. I've only seen a few episodes. Isn't his name Bear Grist? Yes. Bear Grills. Grills. Grills, thanks. Oh. Yeah. The whole saltwater enema. Yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> like, ah. Oh. Number eight, secrete erythropoietin. What the heck is that? That's the stuff that makes... Stimulates the production of red blood cells, exactly. So erythropoietin, remember, goes to bone marrow and tells you to make more red blood cells. Number nine, secretes renin. We haven't talked about this before, but it's a hormone. What should you do? Underline, Underline it. You have to know it. In fact, there are going to be like four or five slides that are going to, I'm going to have to beat this into your mind what renin is. Renin helps regulate blood volume, blood pressure. And number 10, convert vitamin D into its active form. Where is vitamin D made again? Skin. Skin. Where is it activated first? the liver, and then finally it goes to the kidney, and the kidney does the final activation. Here's the anatomy overview. You should know these major parts. Of course, the renal arteries carrying blood in. The renal vein carries blood away. And then the kidney, the major parts, the cortex is going to be where? What's cortex mean? Bark, like bark of a tree, right? So where's it going to be? The outside. So the cortex is on the outside layer. The medulla is going to be down towards the middle. Right? And then the renal pelvis is where everything kind of happens, and we'll go through these.
pictures. So when you take the kidney, and you can see the right kidney sits a little bit lower than the left. Why does the right one sit lower than the left one? The liver. The liver. Yeah, the liver's bushing down on it. So there you've got the right kidney. If you slice that open a little bit, you can see out here is the fibrous capsule around the outside holding every, everything together. Just inside is going to be the cortex. And you see that little dark coloring around here. And you see all these blood vessels in the cortex. And right below it, you have the medullary pyramids. And they call them pyramids because they look kind of like a pyramid. So down here, it looks more like a pyramid. Up here, it's kind of like an upside down pyramid. Like the spaceships that brought the pyramids, right? <laughs> Sorry, I just think that's a gas. Right, and then the renal pelvis is the collecting area that after you've made the urine, you're going to start collecting it here. You drop it down through the ureter. Where's the ureter taking it? Oh to the bladder. How many ureters do you have? Two. Two. Yep, one from each kidney, and then it goes down to the bladder, and from the bladder, you push out through the urethra. So you know the anatomy. We don't have to spend a ton of time talking about it. When we start talking about the micturition reflex, we'll start talking about the muscles again. All right. The major structure, the major functional unit is the nephron. This is the most important structure in the kidney. The nephron's where all the magic happens. It's what's going to filter everything. It's what's going to process everything. If you start blowing apart the nephrons, you're in a world of hurt. Nephrons are extremely delicate, and they remind me of neurons because when a nephron's destroyed, what do you know about it? it can't grow back. Yep. So once you kill one or destroy one, it's gone forever, just like a neuron. When you look at the different components of the nephron, these are underlined for a reason. If you look at the vascular component, what are you talking about when you refer to vasculature? What's going through that? Blood. When you look talk about the tubular component, this is the filtrate, the filtered product from the blood. It's going to be pre-urine. So the vascular components where the blood's flowing, the tubular components where the pre-urine or the urine's flowing. So make sure you know both of these. These are anatomy terms, but it's just like the heart. You have to know the direction of flow and where things are at. So of course the afferent arterial, afferent saying it's going where? At the major structure. So the afferent arterial is carrying blood into the nephron. The glomerulus is this little structure that looks like a ball of yarn to me. So the afferent neuron is flowing into that ball of yarn, and that ball of yarn is kind of like a specialized sprinkler system. So you have all these little tiny pores so that things can leave like water. Glucose, believe it or not, can leave there too. Sodium, potassium, chloride, all these little things are filtering the blood. And then after it's filtered, the remaining blood leaves through what kind of an arterial? If an afferent goes in, an efferent must come out. When you look at these structures too, look at the afferent. It's kind of big. It's like a fire hose. But if you look at it compared to the efferent, the efferent's a lot smaller. It's like half the size of a fire hose, maybe just a big garden hose. So which one's going to have better flow? The afferent. The afferent's got all this better flow. It's a huge vessel. And of course, why can it, why can it have a small vessel leaving because what happened in the glomerulus you filter yeah you filter out a lot of that stuff you lost water you lost electrolytes you lost a lot of stuff as you're going through so you have less substance to leave the glomerulus so the afferent arterial is a little bit bigger right and then the efferent and then from the efferent you go to these peritubular capillaries so if you watch it starts splitting apart and the peritubular peri refers to something being in the perimeter so what's it telling you peritubular <coughs> means it's around the Tubules, yep. So it, it's around the tubules. It's this capillary system that's around the tubules. What do you get at capillaries? Capillaries are the site of exchange. So we'll talk about that, that again. There's a reason that they're not arterioles or arteries or venules or veins, but they're capillaries because you get exchange along this pathway, which is an important concept. Right? And then they all start collecting, and then they're going to go into the renal vein, and then they're going to leave the kidney. So you can see the peritubular capillaries, cap, they're all moving back together. And then these tubules, once I go to the glomerulus, the glomerulus remembers that specialized sprinkler system. It's pushing water and, and electrolytes and sodium, potassium, chloride, glucose, all these little substances out. But what does it not allow? Anything that's a what or bigger? Protein or bigger. It doesn't let protein slip through. Okay? If you think of it as like a specialized strainer, like it's a combination sprinkler slash spaghetti strainer with these little pores in it. The proteins are like the spaghettis. They can't get through the holes. So they slide right along, and then they move on to the next pathway, the ether. <coughs> Only things that are smaller than proteins can get through there. Can an amino acid get through? Is it smaller than a protein? Yes. Remember, protein's breakdown product will become an amino acid. It's a small product. So you can lose amino acids. You can lose glucose through here. When you start collecting this filtered product, which we call the filtrate, the first place you collect it at is this thing called the Bowman's capsule. 
In the Bowman's capsule, it looks like a U here, but it's actually, three-dimensionally, it wraps completely around the glomerulus. It's a capsule. It encapsulates the glomerulus. So anything that leaks out of the glomerulus is caught in the Bowman's capsule. So all the waters, all those sugars, amino acids, electrolytes are all caught here. It's the first part. Okay. The next is the closest tubule, which would be a what? Proximal. Remember, this is a one-way flow. It always starts at Bowman's capsule and moves forward. So the first section, the one that's close to the beginning, is the proximal. And the proximal kind of winds a little bit back and forth here. And then what it does is it starts going down. As it's going down, what do you think down is going to mean? Descending. Yep, so it's going to go down in this descending loop structure. This loop collectively is called the loop of Henle. On this side, you have the descending loop. So descending tubule in the loop. And then you loop around, and as you're going up, it's going to be called the ascending, ascending loop. Yep. And we're going to talk about special features of each of these, so you may think, well, that's insignificant, but it's not. Descending coming this way, ascending going up the other way. And then look at this. The ascending path goes right next to Bowman's capsule. It comes right back to the beginning again. But look how it weaves. It weaves in between the afferent and efferent arterial, and there's a purpose for that. We're going to look at this little section here and talk a lot about it. But where the descending or sorry, descending. The ascending side goes up and crosses back over. It's going to be regulated. It's going to be monitored. So did the kidney filter and process this efficiently enough? And it's going to be able to check right there at the beginning again. So the descending loop comes up, and then it turns into the distal tubule. And the distal tubule is going to start carrying it away and up into this collecting duct. And the collecting duct, that you can see, doesn't have just one nephron to it. It has another one here, another one here, another one here. What's the whole purpose of the collecting duct? to collect the urine now. Yep. So it's coming into the collecting duct, and as it's moving down, it's going to move to the renal pelvis. It all pulls in the renal pelvis, and it drips down what structure into the bladder? The ureter. So it's going to drip down into the ureter and go into the bladder, and then we'll talk about the bladder and beyond from that point. So you have to know these different components, and you have to know the order that they go into. All right. So this is a picture with all of those peritubular capillaries removed, and you can see the same pathway. Blood flow here goes into Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, starts descending down the descending loop of Henle, up the ascending, back over, right next to the afferent and efferent arterioles, and into the distal tubule, collecting duct, renal pelvis, and then out. And this picture, if you look at it kind of sideways, it's the kidney. So you can see overall you have the cortex out here in the outer part, and then you have the medulla down deeper. So what, do you learn, what did you learn so far that's true about the vascular component? What's the first thing you should think of when I say vascular? It's the blood flow, right. So how about number one? The efferent arterial brings the blood to the glomerulus. False. Efferent does what to it? It takes it away from the major structure. So you can cross that one out. How about number two? The efferent, or sorry, afferent arterial is wider than the efferent. That one's true. Yep, so that was easy. You can circle number two, but let's make sure that number three and number four are wrong. Glomerulus is found in the U-shaped portion of the loop of Henle. What was the glomerulus? It's that thing that looks like a ball of yarn, and it sits in what structure? Bowman's, Bowman's capsule. capsule. It's encapsulated by Bowman's capsule. So you know number three is wrong. How about number four? The afferent arterial drains its blood into the peritubular capillaries. What drains its blood into the peritubulars? The efferent. What does the afferent arterial drain its blood into? The glomerulus, right. So we know number one, three, and four are wrong. Two has to be the right answer. All right, and then this is just more anatomy. We kind of already talked about it a little bit. Next major structure you want to pay attention to. So if we're looking at the nephron itself, we're going to zoom in a little bit and talk about this thing called the juxta glomerular apparatus. Juxta means it's juxta next to the glomerulus. doesn't really mean that, but hopefully it makes you remember it. So when you're looking at this thing, it's this area that I told you we'd come back and zoom in on. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus is this area right here next to the glomerulus. Right. And then you're going to have sensing cells in there. So when you look at this, the ascending loop of Henle, remember it comes right back up and through, has special sensing cells that are called macula densa cells. They detect the concentration. So what kind of receptors will it have in there? concentration of water to solute. Osmotic receptors. It's going to have receptors that detect the concentration. So did I concentrate the urine appropriately? Is it too dilute? Is it too concentrated? And those are located right here. So here we have the blood flow coming up and right, my mouse stuck, right in between the afferent and the efferent arterial. 
So those little sensors are going to be right here checking. Did we do this appropriately? If not, we're going to have to adjust the blood flow to do it right. All right? The next ones are called the granular cells, and the granular cells sit on the afferent arterial. So the blood flow going in. So they can regulate the blood flow. What could they do? They could stimulate the smooth muscle and make it do what? If I stimulate a smooth muscle, what's it do? Expand or contract. It contracts. It always contracts. Muscles always contract. So if that smooth muscle around the afferent arterial starts squeezing, what's it doing to the size of the arterial? Yep. So what's that called? Constricting. Yep. It's constricting it. What's it doing to the flow? Just instinctively, what do you know it's doing to the flow? Slowing it down. So what's going to happen to the movement of the urine through that process? It's going to slow down more. Right? And we'll talk about that. These two structures are really important. The macula densa detects the concentration. The granular cells adjust the size of the afferent arterial. So if we zoom in a little bit closer, we're looking at this area right here. So if we took a slice across this and looked, I think, here you can see the distal tubular or the ascending, so right where they connect. And there you see the macula densa cells. They're measuring the concentration of the urine here. They're right next to the granular cells. And these granular cells, look, they're sitting right along the smooth muscle. So they can adjust what's going on at the afferent arterial. What do you know is wrong with this picture? Look at the efferent and the afferent arterial. They look like the same size. Which one should be bigger? The afferent. And this is the one that's going to get the most regulation by these granular cells. And these granular cells are going to release a hormone that we're going to talk about later called renin. It's twice I've mentioned it. Right. So the blood flows in here, it goes through this, like I said, sprinkler-like system, the glomerulus. It filters out all of its products that it wants to get rid of, some that it doesn't necessarily want to get rid of, and they go into the Bowman's capsule and then they're carried off to what segment of the tubule? The closest part of the tubule, the proximal tubule. And then the leftover blood is going to leave and go off through the efferent arterial to the peritubular capillaries. So every time you see a picture like this, just kind of ask yourself, what was the anatomy? You need to remember the anatomy. Okay, two types of neurons. So we've passed the juxtaglomerular apparatus, now we're going on to another section of the types of neurons. You have cortical, I said neurons, I even typed neurons. neurons. It's, what should this be? Nephrons. Nephrons. <coughs> Sp damn spell check. That's the worst thing about spell check is when you write the word correctly, then it doesn't catch it for you. Okay, so cortical nephrons, where do you think most of these are going to be? In the cortex, in the outer edge. Yep. So about 80% of your nephrons are in the cortex. And then 20% are going to be called juxta medullary nephrons because they're juxta next to the medulla. So they're going to go deeper down into the medulla. What's interesting is that only 20% of them are juxta medullary, but these are the ones that do the most concentrating. They're the ones that make your urine extremely what? Clear or extremely yellow? For yellow, yeah. So they do the most of the concentrating of the urine. And they have their own special blood vessels that go next to them. They're called the vas erecta. The vas erecta are basically just modified peritubular capillaries. But the vas erecta only follow the juxtamedullary nephrons. They don't follow the cortical nephrons. They're unique to the juxtamedullary. So when I look at these things, here are the cortical. And the cortical, remember, sits primarily in the cortex. The juxtamedullary stretch deep down in the medulla. What's interesting is that they're doing more of the concentrating, so they're pulling a lot of what out of your urine? pulling a lot of water out of your urine. So if you lived in a desert, you're a desert animal, what would you expect to happen to these juxtamedullary neurons? Would they be shorter or longer? Longer. Why would they be longer? So it gives them more time to absorb more water. Yeah, I had a professor in college that when he talked about the, the kidneys, his, his first specialty was in renal. And he said they had a kangaroo rat they let run around their lab. And a kangaroo rat is basically a rat. But, and it lives in the desert. So when it would urinate, they'd find these little like, puddles that look like syrup on the floor, these perfectly round little balls or spheres of urine. Instead of being a puddle that spread out all over the place, they were like this condensed little structure that was really like syrup. Why was it like syrup? It was a desert animal, so its urine was extremely concentrated. It was really thick. Right. Okay. And then you can see the same thing in the loop. The vas erecta will run right along here, but only in one type of nephron. What type of nephron is it? The juxtamedullary. So when this is longer, this turns into a structure called the vas erecta. Right? Put a star by this. You have to know this. 
Just like in the, in the GI tract, I said there were four primary functions of the GI tract. <coughs> Motility, digestion, secretion, absorption. There are three primary functions of the renal system you have to know. And the first one's called glomerular filtration. Where does it happen at? Glomerulus. Yep. And filtration means what's it doing compared to the blood? It's moving things where? Into the blood or out of the blood? It's out of the blood. It's filtering out of the blood. This is non-discriminate. It doesn't care what it moves. It's, there are no transporters to move anything. It's just like a strainer in your kitchen. If you put salt in your spaghetti water and you dump it, anybody do that? Put salt? Anybody put oil in their water too? Okay, I do that. So salt and the oil and the spaghetti absorb some of the oil, but when you dump the water out into the strainer, does the oil stay behind? Nope, it goes right out. Even though it was good oil, it's gone. How about the salt that was in the water? Does it stay behind? It's gone too. That's indiscriminate or non-discriminate filtration. I'm only pulling out the large things. There's no special transporters or anything. So I keep the proteins and anything bigger than a protein, like whole cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, those all stay in my blood, but sugar can slide through. Do I want to keep sugar? I, do you want to keep sugar in your blood? Yes. Amino acids can slide through. Do you want to keep amino acids? Absolutely, you want to keep amino acids. These things slide through through filtration. It's not picky. It accidentally just pushes these little particles through. So what do you know has to happen to those two particles somewhere down the road? If you want to keep them in the blood, you have to reabsorb them somewhere, which is next. All right, so tubular reabsorption is bringing things back into the blood. So tubular reabsorption bringing back into the blood. This is selective because tubular reabsorption is an active process, which means you have to spend what? You have to spend energy getting the stuff back in. Ah, stinking clock. So you have to spend energy getting it back in. Anything your body spends energy on has to be really, really important. So anything you're reabsorbing means that those things are really, really important. So when you reabsorb something like sugar, is it important to your body? Yes. Your whole goal of life is to get sugar. Find sugar or foods that you can turn into sugar and bring them into your body. Your, most of your energy spent in a day is supposed to be focused on finding food, evolutionarily speaking. So it's finding food and bringing it in. That sugar is really, really important. The same thing with amino acids. You're finding protein and amino acids to build muscle. Do you want to lose amino acids in your urine? Do you want to? No. no. So the processes of bringing things back into your blood that require energy are for things that are only important. Like when you're reabsorbing sugar or amino acids, they're important. Salt, when you reabsorb it, it requires a pump that requires energy. It's super important. So even though we talk about salt, too much salt in our diet being bad, you have to have salt to this extent. All right, so tubular reabsorption moves it from the tubule into the blood. What's the name of those blood vessels that go around the tubules? The peritubular capillaries. And you know you get exchanged there because they're capillaries. All right. Next is tubular secretion. So secretion means what am I doing with it? Am I pulling it into my blood or moving it out? I'm pushing it out. Yep, so secretion means I'm moving out of the blood and into, or out of the blood. I'm pulling it out of the tubules and moving into the blood. Sorry, somebody getting up and leaving and then walking out that door was kind of distracting for a second. Do I name names? Do I point fingers? I should. Okay, so tubular secretion is when you're pulling it from the tubule and you're, or uh, pulling it from the blood and putting it into the tubule. Totally distracted for a second. Sorry about that. All right, so... If you're moving this, this is also an active process. Is it an important process? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's it telling you about this stuff that you're trying to get rid of that must be really, really important? Important in the opposite way, right? It's really, really <laughs> bad. It's important to get rid of it. Yeah. So things like acid. You know, acid, you have to have some acid in your, in your body to an extent, but too much acid is really, really dangerous, so you're going to try and push it out. When you secrete something, it's something that's bad for you. You're trying to get rid of it. So, so let me re-say this again now that I have a clear mind. What? Are you secreting it back into the blood? You're secreting it into the <laughs> tubule. <laughs> yeah, down sorry. Down okay. into the blood. Okay. Yep, I accidentally said the blood. So reabsorption is going into the blood. Secretion is going out of the blood. It's going into the tubule. Bad stuff. Okay. All right. So this is a summary. Filtration is going where? Out of the blood, it's being filtered. Reabsorption is going where? Back into the blood. And secretion is going where? Out of the blood. 
The difference between filtration and secretion is that, number one, secretion is an active process. Was this active? Nope. It just passively filters things through. And another thing is, look at the location. Where is this happening? The glomerulus. Where is this one happening? At the tubules. So this is moving out of the blood and going into the tubules, where this is going through the tubule wall instead of going to Bowman's capsule. So the overall result, urinary excretion, getting rid of the substances you don't want, keeping them in. And your book has a little cartoon that looks like this. Here's where glomerular filtration is happening. You filter out as it's moving along. Anything that's important, like what's an important thing you want to pull back in? Sugar. sugar. Yep, you pull back sugar. Should you have any sugar in your urine? Nope. So ideally, all of the sugar that accidentally slips through, you should pull right back in. And then here, secreting means that something bad is in here and is trying to push it into the tubule. Tubular secretion. And then after it moves past here, once it gets down into the collecting duct, and it drops into the pelvis, there's no bringing it back. So anything that's left over when it hits the renal pelvis is committed to go into the bladder. It's committed to go out of your body. And then they put another cartoon, just in case you don't like the overall picture of the nephron, they break it down a little bit more for you. Right, so when liquid goes from the tubular lumen to the peritubular capillaries, so it's going from the lumen of the tubule into the capillaries. What's in the capillaries? Blood. blood. So it's pulling it into the blood. What do we always call that? Reabsorption. Reabsorption. I'm going to have to spend the next like half hour fixing that stinking tubule thing. I'm pointing fingers next time somebody walks out. Okay. So the process is filtration. And I already told you, where is that happening? At the glomerulus. It happens at the glomerulus, so you may as well write that down by filtration. So you have three layers of glomerular mem membrane. It's like having a spaghetti strainer instead of another spaghetti strainer instead of another one. So three layers. In the first one, you have the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are telling you they're lining what? Endothelium is always on the inside of a blood vessel, always inside of a blood vessel. So this is the side that's actually making contact with the blood. So it's your first spaghetti strainer. The second one, once it gets through that first one, now you have this stuff called basement membrane that's full of collagen and glycoproteins. As bad as I hate to use this example, this is the one that helped me remember it. So the collagen and glycoproteins are like a cigarette filter. Right? So there are all these woven little particles weaving back and forth. So it's kind of like having a terry cloth underneath your spaghetti strainer. Does that help for anybody? So. For those of you that never cooked, going, what the hell is a terry cloth? <laughs> Who's terry? <laughs> That's the same cloth to make, yep, yeah, when you squeeze down, yeah, or yogurt. Cheese. Yeah, did they also call it a cheesecloth? Yeah. Yeah. If that helped anybody, right. So what the hell's cheese? <laughs> but, and then number three, the inner layer of filtration slits. So once it gets through that cloth, there's one more layer. And the interesting thing about this last layer is this is kind of like a movable layer. So it can adjust. If you look at it, so we're going to zoom in. Here's your glomerulus, and you can see all those layers stacking there. Going closer, here's where the blood would normally be at. Here's your first spaghetti strainer. So you have these little capillary pores that are in between the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells have those cracks in them. Things can slide through. So if it's small enough to slide through, next it has to go through this membrane that's like a terry cloth. I'm going to try and use that instead of a cigarette filter. But. So you have this little filtry membrane. What's interesting about this filtry membrane is it has a charge to it. So it's going to repel anything it doesn't like. So if something's small enough to get through here, but it's holding a charge, bink, it can pass, pass it back out if it doesn't like it. And then if something gets through that terry cloth and down below, you have these little foot processes. And these are kind of interesting because you have these cells that are called podocytes. What's a podiatrist do? <laughs> Works on feet, right? So a podocyte is a cell that's a foot cell. And when you look at these feet cells, they can actually adjust a little bit. So if you want to adjust the flow through there, you can. So three layers that this product has to go through. Okay? None of it's for transporters. All of it's passive movement. It slides through the, the pores on the first one, slides through the filter on the second one, and it has a slide between the podocytes on the third. So you can see that process moving through again. Three steps. And then finally, it's in the lumen of the Bowman's capsule. So now it's considered, what's the name of that F word that I told you? Filtrate, yep. I saw smiles on some people's faces. You need to be careful. The appropriate F word. <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't even think about it until it came out of my mouth. And people are going... <laughs> so, in order for a substance to be filtered, it has to move through all the following except for what? What does it not have to move through? Oh, somebody walked out and I forgot to point fingers. But they're coming back. They left their books. A little different. So, in order for a substance to be filtered, it has to pass through all of what except... All of what except that? Ugh. Still just as flustered. Does it have to pass through filtration slits? Yep. Does it have to slide through the capillary pores or fenestrations? Yes. Yep. And then the basement membrane, what was that? That was the terry cloth filter thing. Right. So it has to pass through all three of those. Juxtaglomerular apparatus? No. It's not passing through that. It's an area. There she went! There she went! <laughs> that was actually kind of funny because she ran out. <laughs> she knew I was going to point the fingers. I did catch the hair bobbing, so I knew it was a female. Okay, so major force responsible for inducing glomerular filtration. I won't make them feel bad when they come back in, because at least they're coming back in. <laughs> but when they leave their books behind, then I know. All right, major force responsible for inducing glomerular filtration. These are the same forces we talked about before. Remember that capillary blood pressure? What's causing capillary blood pressure? Your heart beating, right. So your capillary blood pressure, remember, it's your heart pushing the blood forward. Now we're just specifying, instead of it being at all of your capillaries, now we're specifically saying at the glomerulus. All right, the next one is Bowman's capsules osmotic pressure. So Bowman's capsules colloids are talking about what's in Bowman's capsule? Proteins. Should you have proteins in Bowman's capsule? You shouldn't. You shouldn't have the proteins in Bowman's capsule, so what should this normally be? What pressure? Yeah. Nothing, exactly. You only see this when somebody has some kind of disorder. If, they're, if their nephrons are being damaged, then proteins can sleep through. Is that a good thing? No, it's bad news. They're losing proteins out of their blood, which means what's going to chase those proteins? More water, which means they're going to lose more water. Bad news. Can your heart, can your blood pressure change? Yep, so this can change pretty easily. This shouldn't change very easily. Right, the two major forces responsible for opposing filtration. What's the little magic word that actually means opposing filtration? It's trying to be what compared to the blood? It's trying to be reabsorbed into the blood. So when you, you can either look at reabsorption or here we're talking about the term opposing filtration, which you can kind of keep a reabsorption in the back of your mind. So one's blood, blood colloid osmotic pressure. Those are the proteins where? In the blood. What are they trying to do with water? Push it out or keep it in? It's trying to keep it in, exactly. So what's, what's that going to prevent it from doing? It's going to prevent it from being what to the, from the blood? Secretor filtered, right. It's going to keep it from being filtered from the blood. These are opposing filtration. How about Bowman's capsules, hydrostatic pressure? Remember when I talked about hydrostatic pressure before for your general body? It's the skin squeezing and trying to push water back into the blood. So what's it doing? Reabsorbing or filtrating? It's trying to make you reabsorb, which is opposing filtration. Okay. So kidney people just use the word opposing filtration instead of just being simple and saying reabsorption. So this is a force preventing things from going into Bowman's capsule. If Bowman's capsule fills up too fast, it's like a water balloon. It's gonna, is it going to be easy to push the water in there when it's really full? Nope, because it's pushing back. It's trying to oppose that filtration. All right. So when we break these down and look at them, the one that has the biggest influence on filtering through the glomerulus is the blood capillary pressure, or capillary blood pressure. Because this one can change. You jump on a treadmill, does your blood pressure change? It changes right away, exactly. Okay. As far as the blood colloid osmotic pressure, adding proteins to your blood, does that change right away? Yeah. Nope, it takes time to do that. Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure, it takes time to change that. The only one that has a really fast influence is going to be this capillary blood pressure. You can change that in milliseconds. Right? So what you already know, wide afferent and narrow efferent, you have more flow going in, less flow going out. What would happen if I tried pushing lots and lots of water into a sprinkler, but I had a little tiny hole coming out the other side? What's going to happen to the leakage in that sprinkler? High leakage or just a little dribble? Big fire hose here, garden hose down here. What's going to happen in this filter or this sprinkler? Lots of filtration, <coughs> just barely any. Lots. All this pressure coming in, it doesn't want to just sit here. It wants to find some way to get out. A little bit's going to go straight through and into the 
efferent structure, the garden hose, a lot of it's going to start going sprinkling out all over the place. All right. The fluid pressure exerted by the blood within the glomerular capillaries, this is basically the blood pressure. Right. It depends on the contraction of the heart. So what happens if your heart contraction goes up? What's going to happen to this blood pressure? It goes up with it. What's going to happen to your filtration rate if your blood pressure increases? It goes faster. You filter more. So it's going to try and filter more and faster. And then the average pressure, you might want to put a little underline underneath that. Remember when we talked about these pressures before? What's the capillary blood pressure? What's the interstitial fluid, hydrostatic pressure, all those things? We're going to calculate a net pressure again. So the first one, the average pressure is 55. What's your average systolic pressure in your arteries? 120. Yeah, so this is a big change. This is a large drop. Why do you think you want it to drop really low as it's going into the, into the kidney and into those nephrons? Because if it's really high, what would happen to the nephron? You blow that sucker out, right? It's, it's designed for filtration. It's one cell thick. If you crank up the pressure, then you're going to blow them apart. So is, high, is chronic high blood pressure good for your kidney? No. no, it's really bad for your kidney. Right. And then we already know this because I already said it, but increased blood pressure increases the filtration rate in the Bowman's capsule. So you raise your blood pressure, you raise your filtration rate. It's a hand-in-hand -hand situation. All right, so the Bowman's capsule, colloid osmotic pressure I talked about, should you have proteins in Bowman's capsule? No. Nope. So your pressure should be zero. If there were proteins in there, they'd pull more water through, and that would raise your filtration pressure. Next, blood colloid osmotic pressure. So these are the proteins in the blood. Proteins in the blood are trying to hold water into the blood. So what's that doing? Filtering or opposing filtering? It opposes filtration. And it's caused because you have proteins in the blood, but you shouldn't have proteins in Bowman's capsule. So it's trying to pull water back into the blood at 30 millimeters of mercury. What would that be, a positive or a negative value? Remember when we talked about this before? If it's reabsorption, it's what value? It's adding to the blood, so it must be positive. positive. If it's trying to push out of the blood, it's negative. negative. So what is this? Positive. This is a positive value. What was this one back here? This is trying to push stuff out of the blood. Negative. negative. So we've got a negative 55. Whether you want to put a negative or positive here, you can. If this is 1, let's say this is 1, what would it be, a positive or a negative 1? It's trying to pull out of the blood. It would be a negative. Right? And then this is a positive. So we've got negative 55 plus 30, so far at what? Negative 25. Right? And this last one, the Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. This is Bowman's capsule saying, I'm full, I'm full, and I'm going to push stuff back into the blood. What would that be, filtering or opposing filter? Opposing filtration, what did that get? A positive or a negative value? Positive because it's trying to push it where? It's adding it back to the blood. So we have negative 15, and now we have another positive. So what's our total value? So negative 25 plus 15, negative 15. Because it's negative, what process wins? Filtration. Do you want filtration at the kidney? Yes, so you want it to be negative. Right? So when you take your forces favoring, remember those are, are going to be negatives. The ones opposing filtration are going to be reabsorption, so they're going to be positives. Negative 55 plus 50 or 45 comes out to negative 10. So overall, you have a filtration force and a nice, healthy person. Let's see if you remember how to do this. So the letters are pretty much the same. The only thing that really changed was we're talking about Bowman's capsule instead of the interstitial fluid. So here's your capillary blood pressure, positive or negative? Negative. Negative because it's pushing out of the blood, right? And then how about Bowman's capsule colloids? They're trying to do what? Push things into the blood or out of the blood? Out. So what's it get? Negative. Negative. So what are we at so far? Negative 30. Negative 30. And then, of course, if those two are negatives, what can you assume about the next two? They're positive. So negative 30 plus 50 is a what? Positive 20. What's happening if it's positive? Reabsorption. So reabsorption is also called opposing filtration. So it has to be either this one or that one. Which one's right? Number one. 
what's happening at the kidney? What are the kidneys not doing? They're not filtering. So what's happening to your urine production? If you're not filtering, what's happening to your urine production? Yeah, it's, going down. it's going down. What's happening to your ability to get rid of toxins? Going down. going down, exactly. What would be happening to your blood volume, though? It's going up because you're retaining lots of water in your blood. So, by the way, what's happening to their blood pressure in this situation? It's going up. If you retain the volume, you have to push the blood pressure up. All right. So when we look at this, the glomerular filtration rate is the rate that we filter things through the glomerulus. This GFR, the rate that we filter, is directly related to the nut filtration pressure. If your nut filtration pressure is positive, what's happening? You're reabsorbing. Are you filtering anything? Nope. So you always need a negative value at the end of that. You're always trying to shoot for a negative value for filtration. If I increase that negative value, what do I do to the filtration rate? So if I make that <coughs> from negative 10 to negative 50, what do I do to the filtration rate? I increase the filtration rate. I'm filtering faster and faster and faster. And this is a, an equation that says the GFR is equal to the coefficient, which is a standard number, times the net filtration pressure. So all you have to do is remember, if you had an equation like this, if this is, we'll say the, this is 1. If this is 2 as a final answer, what's this have to be? 1 times what equals 2? 1 times 2. If I double this and turn it into 4, what happens to the GFR? It also turns into 4. If I turn this into 6, what happens to the GFR? It turns into 6. This number doesn't change. It's consistent. So it's telling you that the higher the filtration pressure, what's going to happen to your filtration rate? The higher the filtration rate. That's what you want to remember, not how to calculate this. It's just a general rule of thumb. Right? Here's the next thing you want to put a star by. Normally about 20% of the blood, the plasma that goes into the glomerulus is filtered. So does that mean that all of the blood's filtered? No. Nope. So do you have some toxins left behind? Yep, you're going to have some toxins. You're going to have water left behind? Yes. Absolutely. That's what flows out. So about 20% of what goes in actually gets filtered. So if I have five liters of blood that go into my kidney in one minute, how much comes out of the kidney in a minute? Quick math. Four liters. So how much urine, or how much urine did I make in that time? About a liter. Yeah, I made about a liter of a urine. It's a lot of urine. It's like urinating into a two-liter bottle of soda, which sounds really offensive now that I say it, but I'm filling it halfway up. So 20% of the plasma that goes through is actually filtered. The rest just flows on by. Right? And that's when the pressure's at 10. What's going to happen to that filtration rate if this doubles and goes to 20? It's going to increase. Yep, it's going to increase the amount of filtration, the filtrate. Right? And then here's the magic number. So on average, about 180 liters every day are filtered. 180 liters. How could you visualize that? How many 2-liter bottles of soda would that be? 92 liter bottles of soda in a day. That's how much you filter. Is that how much you urinate out? Not even close. So what's that tell you? Of that 180 liters, what, do, what happens to most of these? They get reabsorbed. Exactly. Yeah. So 180 liters a day are filtered. Your glomerular, glomerular filtration rate is about 125 milliliters for every minute in a man, about 115 in a female. That's a lot of filtering. And then I already said this once before, but here it is again. So a change in GFR primarily is because of a change in capillary blood pressure. So if I raise that blood pressure, I have a raise in GFR. The other three properties don't change as much. So while we're still talking about GFR, I already mentioned this. This is the third time I'm mentioning it. It must be important. But glomerular capillary blood pressure is what we control. So if I want to turn down filtration, if I'm making way too much urine, what can I do to that blood vessel? What's the name of that blood vessel, by the way, that's going into the glomerulus? The afferent arterial. What can I do to it? Constrict it. What's it going to do to my flow? Slows it down. Yep. So it reduces the pressure going into the kidney. It's going to reduce the flow. What's going to happen to my urine production? It decreases. So you can see that direct relationship. If I turn down the blood flow into the kidney, I turn down my glomerular filtration rate, which turns down my urine production. What's it going to give me more time to do with that stuff in the nephron? Not filter, 
reabsorb, exactly. If I turn down the filtration rate, but I'm going to turn up my reabsorption. This gives me more time to reabsorb it. So what's going to happen to my urine? What's going to look like? Dark. Yep. So I'm turning down the flow. I'm making less urine, and I'm also reabsorbing all the good stuff out of it, which makes it more dilute or concentrated. More concentrated. makes it more yellow in color. Okay. And then the blood colloid osmotic pressure, basically the other three pressures, they're not regulated. So the only one that's controlled or regulated is that capillary blood pressure. The other three should be really consistent. Okay. Two mechanisms for controlling this GFR. Right. The first one's autoregulation. What organ are we talking about? The kidney. So autoregulation means what's controlling the kidney? It's the kidney controlling the kidney. And this is a short-term regulation. The kidney, if you get a spike in blood pressure really quick and the kidney has all this pressure coming in rapidly, what's it going to want to do? To protect its nephrons, what's it going to want to do? Take those blood vessels and do what with them? Constrict them down, exactly. It's a short-term regulation. So when you exercise, the kidney will actually pinch off those arterioles a little bit so you don't blow out the nephrons. It's not meant for long-term. So it's not the same as when you have long-term chronic stress and you're always stressed out and your heart's beating like crazy and your blood pressure's really high. Okay? This is for short-term fixing it. After you've been pushing this for a long, long time, then the kidney's going to go, oh, I'm so tired, and it's going to let up. What's going to happen to the flow through the kidney suddenly? When the kidney stops and relaxes, that afferent arterial, even though your blood pressure is really high, the blood pressure is going to shoot into the kidneys and do what to the nephrons possibly? Start damaging nephrons. So chronic high blood pressure is bad news on the kidney. The kidney can only take care of it for a short time. That's autoregulation. Next is the extrinsic sympathetic control. This is more for long-term regulation. The problem is if you have chronic high blood pressure, what's going on with your sympathetic nervous system? Is it too low or is it too high? Chronic high blood pressure. It's typically too high. Your anxiety is high. It's turning up your sympathetic nervous system. It's causing all these problems. So for long-term regulation, if this thing's broken, it's going to cause more problems and it's going to control good. But if the kidney can't handle it for very long, then the sympathetic nervous system is another problem. We'll say, it's okay, I'm going to step in and I'm going to control these blood vessels a little bit for you. And what's interesting about the sympathetic nervous system is what's it looking out for? Is it looking out for the, the well-being of the kidney? It's looking out for the well-being of the brain, exactly. So what would happen if your blood pressure dropped? What would the sympathetic nervous system do? It would do what to the blood vessels? Constrict them. Why? Why is it trying to constrict your blood vessels in your peripheral system? It's trying to push the blood back to your brain, right? What's it doing to the blood flow of the kidney? Decreasing the blood flow of the kidney. Does the kidney need blood? Yeah, so if it's long term, it's going to cut off supply of the kidney too. So lots of damage that happens when you have this regulation of sympathetic nervous system. Right, so that auto-regulation, what's controlling the kidney? The kidney. the kidney. And how it does it, I already said, afferent arterial control. So if I control that afferent arterial, I control the flow that's going through the kidney. And you remember this equation because you've seen it probably 12,000 times by now. <laughs> right? But the kidney in its auto-regulation wants to keep that blood flow low. If your blood flow gets up between 80 and 180 millimeters of mercury, the kidney is going to start doing what to the resistance? It's going to increase the resistance. What, how is it going to increase the resistance? Yep. So if it shrinks the radius, it increases the resistance. What's it going to do to the flow coming through? It's going to decrease the flow. Yep. You already know that pathway. I'm just reminding you. All right. Myogenic is telling you what's controlling it here. Muscle. What kind of muscle is on the kidney? Cardiac? Heck no. How about skeletal? How do you know it's not skeletal? Because that would be voluntary. You can't voluntarily do anything in your kidney, or in the kidney. Remember, you can control urination, but that's later. But myogenic is talking about smooth muscle. Right? If you get a rapid stretch in that smooth muscle, what's it want to do? So if my blood pressure spikes whoop, real quick, what's that smooth muscle want to do? <coughs> Constrict back down. So it'll help regulate that way. And that's inside the kidneys, <coughs> auto-regulation. Next one, tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. Ugh, that's a lot of words. That's the tubule controlling the glomerulus. Right? When we talk about those different structures, remember the granular cells and the macula densa cells? Those sit in that juxtaglomerular apparatus. The granular cells release what chemical? Do you remember? Renin. Renin. Yep, R-E-N-I-N. -I -N. 
The macular densa we're, we're determining what? Osmotic. Osmotic pressure, the concentration. I don't know why I said pressure. Osmotic concentration. All right. So these cells in the just glomerular apparatus control the blood flow. If your concentration is way dilute, it's really thick urine, what do you think it's going to do to those blood vessels? This takes a little bit of thinking. This is the physiology, the trick with physiology. If your urine is way too thick and di or concentrated, what's it going to try and do to it? I already gave you the answer. It's going to try and dilute it. What's it going to do to the blood vessels? If you dilate them, it opens up flood flow, fl blood flow, which does what to the filtration rate? Increases the filtration rate. What's it going to do to the flow through the tubule then? Move it along faster, which means it's going to push more water into it. What's it going to do to the urine? Make it more concentrated or dilute? More dilute. So it fixed the problem. What kind of loop is that, by the way? Negative, Negative feedback loop again. Yep. So if, you start if this whole process starts because the urine is too concentrated, you open up the blood vessels, you increase the filtration rate, you increase the flow through the tubules, and it dilutes the urine, it shuts that pathway back off. It's a negative feedback loop. All of these functions are all where? In the kidney. It's all the kidney controlling the kidney. The kidney measuring what's happening with concentrations. The kidney measuring the smooth muscle stretch in the kidney. The kidney telling the arterioles squeeze down or relax. So here's the visual way of imagining this. Here's your afferent and your efferent. Remember, afferent's bigger. What happens if my blood pressure spikes really quick? What's going to happen to my filtration? It's going to increase. So my filtration rate's going to increase. What's going to happen to my urine production? It's going to increase. If this spikes really rapidly, what's the kidney going to think? Whoa, way too much. What's going to tell the ar afferent arterial? Constrict. Constrict. It's going to say squeeze down a little bit. What's going to happen to your, your pressure in the glomerulus? If you squeeze down the blood vessel, what happens to the pressure in the glomerulus afterwards? The pressure drops. What's going to happen to your filtration rate? It goes down. What's going to happen to your urine production? It goes down. What's going to happen to your urine concentration? It's going to increase in concentration and get thicker. Always think the steps. What's going to happen at each of the steps? Right. And then this is, I just said it out loud, but you can see a spike in blood pressure. is going to drive the increase in the flow. It's going to increase your glomerular filtration rate. It's going to start pushing the blood flow through too much. What's going to happen when I push too much blood flow through? What's the kidney going to think? Slow it down. What's it going to do? It's going to release a vasoactive substance. What's it going to do to the, that blood vessel? Constrict. Constrict it. So now I get vasoconstriction at the arterial, afferent arterial. What's going to happen to the flow now? It decreases the flow. What's going to happen to my filtration rate? It decreases. Yeah. So you can see the response. This is autoregulation. If I have a spike in blood pressure like exercise, the kidney goes, heck no, I'm not taking all that blood pressure. It's going to control the size of the blood vessel and squeeze it down a little bit. So it can still do its job, but it's not taking all that pressure anymore. Right? So that was the auto-regulation. Extrinsic is what system? <coughs> sympathetic. Yep, so think sympathetic nervous system. It's for long-term regulation. Okay, so the input there is going to the afferent arterioles. What's the name of the chemical the sympathetic nervous system is going to release on the afferent arterioles? Sympathetic is associated with norepinephrine. Yep, so think of that fight or flight, the adrenaline response, so it's norepinephrine. So when the plasma volume drops, what's the sympathetic nervous system going to think? It's selfish. <laughs> so if the sympathetic nervous system is going to think what? It's going to think, holy crap, I'm not getting enough blood to the brain, so we'll do what to the kidney? Screw the kidney. <laughs> right? It's going to release norepinephrine onto the kidney and do what to the afferent arterioles? Squeeze them down, constrict them down. When it squeezes them down, what's it doing to the filtration rate? Slows it down. So what's it doing to my urine, urine production? It decreases the urine production. If you want to test this out, um, drink a bunch of water and then go run on a treadmill. So as you're running on the treadmill, what you'll find is that you don't have to urinate typically until you stop. Why don't you have to urinate until you stop? Because you've constricted the blood flow going into the kidney, right? So you're slowing down the blood flow. When you do urinate after that, what's the urine look like? It's usually what? Very clear or very dark? dark, dark. It's darker. Yeah, after you've exercised for a long time, a good hard exercise where your sympathetic nervous system is kicking in, it's making you get more concentrated urine. 
Why is it saving the water, by the way? Why would it want to save the water? What are you probably doing if you're exercising hard? You're sweating. Yeah. So if you don't remember the exact physiological process and you get hit with something like this on a test thing, what would my body do if I, if I ran? It turns on the sympathetic nervous system. What's it doing in my urine production? It goes down, which means the filtration rate must have gone down. Right? And then the brain's the most powerful controller in the body, so it can actually override the kidney. So it can actually override the kidney to the point where the kidney starves. It can be bad news. All right. So it looks like we're stopping right there, and we'll talk about the baroreceptor reflex when we come back.